maybe as we start, uh, Barry, do you want to say a few words first about what really got you started making this? How did you come to this story? Well, I, I say this a lot. Um, I can't even imagine three and a half years ago of being here and, and having the introduction we did before this with Ambassador Kennedy that would be here. Um, you know, my, my uncle Eddie, Eddie Chantanet, uh, my great uncle, is in the film, and that was his best friend Norman growing up. And it was part of our family, part of that legacy for us. Uh, but honestly, I didn't quite understand it until uh, much much later in life. Like a lot of us, you don't really understand some of the things you may be told by your granddad or your, your, your great uncles. But um, three years ago, or three and a half years ago now, I came across a, a photo of Norman one of the family members and it just struck me that the you know, 17 year old or at the time 19 year old young man find yourself in the absolute uh, wrong place at the wrong time so uh, I dug a little deeper and every every thread through each of the 12 POWs that uh, were lost in Hiroshima that, that one thread that connected them all was Mr. Mori and uh, it was a photo of Mr. Mori along with the grandson of Harry Truman where uh, Mori's time was showing his plaque that he had put up with the POWs. And I think that was a tipping point for me anyways, was to really dig deeper and understand what Mr. Ord was all about. So um, that's kind of how it started in, in, a, in, a, in a three and a half years and an amazing journey. Uh, a number of trips, four trips to Japan, <laughs> uh, including one solo where uh, it was just myself in a backpack and an uh, English and Japanese dictionary uh, to go meet Morrison. So kind of where it started from. And in fact, the story goes on and on and on. When the film, the film was finished in February of this year. And at that point, of course, no one had any idea that President Obama would be going to Hiroshima, <laughs> that President Obama would meet this man, and not only meet him, but embrace him uh, in that totally moving way. Um, so the story continues to, to unfold. Mr. Mori is coming to America this October for the first time. He's never been out of Japan before. Uh, and when we invited him to come, I fully expected him to say, which is true, that he couldn't make the trip because he's not in very good health. He's quite frail. And his doctors had always told him he couldn't travel. He couldn't travel. So I invited him, expecting him to say no, and he sent me back an email immediately saying, well, I have to ask first my wife, and then I have to ask my doctors. And the next day came another email saying, my wife says okay, but I'm gonna see my doctors next week. And then a couple of days later, he wrote and said, my doctor said, Mr. Mori, you must go, because you are Japan's treasure. It wasn't until really late, mid-70s, that the Department of Defense released what had happened and officially confirmed that. There's certainly all that discussions around it, but it wasn't until the 70s that they officially came out with it. Um, you know, Mr. Mori talks to us a lot about, you know, he reached out to each of the families, and his goal was to make sure that they knew what happened but also to have their names, uh, their releases on the, the remembrance, the wall of remembrance and also in, in the archives. So some of them were, were at first, um, didn't quite understand. They thought maybe he was looking for money or his, uh, you know, his, uh, he wasn't looking for the right reasons. But um, you know, the, over time he sort of won everybody over, including Connie we've seen, and certainly Ralph. He had to find the, the Neal family through other connections. and. To this day, they all get Christmas cards from the Mortys, and um, so there's quite a, quite a connection there. And there's some amazing stories. Uh, you know, you remember when he was reaching out to some of these folks, it had to be maybe 80s and 90s. Um, he'd call 411 in each of the cities and go through the the chains of each of the names. And you know, we talked about this. You know, it's it's one thing maybe for Seth, but if you're looking for a Neil or a Ryan. Uh, it gets to be tricky, and there's some funny stories about his wife uh, rolling her eyes at how much the phone bill costs <laughs> over time. But, uh, but he wanted to do this, and it was, it was just his calling. When we screened this in Tokyo, uh, Mr. Mori actually shared a, a very cool and funny story, which is that he was trying to contact, he 
Was it um, Ralph's family that was the very last one? Uh, what did that in the Hanshaw family? Kind one of, of anyway, there was one that he still hadn't been able to find after like decades, and so he decided to write the embassy in Tokyo, who then said, you know, you can just write a letter to the White House. And so he just wrote a letter to the President of the United States at the White House, and he didn't write, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue or anything, and it got delivered, and within three weeks they had contacted the family and found it for him. Well, um, you know, some of that artwork is obviously stock, uh, stock video, and it's from the, the archives, or from uh, most of the archives, actually some of them provided through the folks in Japan, um, family members certainly, but I think the, the bulk of it actually, uh, and this was a decision Max and I talked about really early on, is uh, the hand-drawn images depicting um, what the Japanese people experienced, and I think for us this became such a very personal listening to the people from either Lowell or from Kentucky talk about their loved ones and then understanding, you know, Mr. Mori and his journey, as we talked to each one of them and their, the eyewitnesses, it became, those images really became much more, more powerful than any image, any stock photography can do. Because they were really what they saw. And they're not perfect. And neither are the memories, but they're very, that's what they, uh, and very moving, so. If I could just add a footnote to that. Over the decades in Japan since Hiroshima, there have been a number of initiatives, especially by the Japanese NHK, the Japanese Broadcasting Entity, to go back to the survivors, who were becoming fewer and fewer as time went on, to ask them to draw their memories of you know, what they had, what they had experienced. Because of course, CNN wasn't there filming, it, and there were no photographs of actually what was happening while it was happening. So the best that could be done would be to ask survivors to draw there. So many of those uh, paintings that you saw were done 10 years, 20 years, 30 years after, um, but come out of the memories of the survivors. So the, the final missions around the 24th and the 28th, you know, it was really just to put the final, those final ships out of commission. But as we talked with, with there's a gentleman who didn't quite make the film, but we talked to a person who was on, that, on the deck of the Rana. Those boats, the ships were empty. They had no fuel. They were really just had ammo. All the fuel had been transferred off of it. And there wasn't much left of it. And this gentleman at the time, the 15-year-old kid with a tube in his back because he'd already taken an injury a few days later trying to shoot at the lonesome lady. And the same thing with the Tone. The Tone, um, it was already hit a few days before. <laughs> And the mission that Norman was on uh, was to bomb it again. You know? And the story with the Lonesome Lady, I mean, Ralph, uh, Ralph wasn't supposed to be in that plane. He, uh, the other uh, waste gunner was sick, so he volunteered. Also, the, uh, the captain of the Lonesome Lady, you may have seen early on there were letters that Mr. Morrow was handling to Thomas Cartwright, and there were letters from Thomas Cartwright. Well, Cartwright was the captain of the Lonesome Lady. And because he was the senior officer who had been captured, I think on August 4th or August 5th, he was sent to Tokyo for interrogation. So he luckily uh, was not killed in the bomb. He was, he was in Tokyo. And uh, he was one of the first people that Mr. Mori was able to contact. And I think it was in the 50s, sometime in the 50s, they bonded as extraordinarily, a really incredible friendship developed between this Japanese man in Hiroshima and Thomas Cartwright, who died just two years ago, I believe. And another detail about Thomas Cartwright is that when he first went to Hiroshima, he was too, the memories of being, of the fear of being interrogated and everything were so strong that he had a really negative experience. And so when Mr. Mori invited him to come back to Hiroshima to meet Mr. Mori, Mr. Mori decided, you know, I really need to do something to make it special for him. And so he took a night job as a security guard to pay the $6,000 to build that golden plaque. <laughs> and so that it was there when Mr. Cartwright was able to come. And I found that detail to be just mind-blowing. And actually, Cart Cartwright was the one who wrote the, the words on that plaque. So they worked together on it. So it was one of the early, really joint you know, things they did together. I was wondering what he did for um, his day job. 
They say Securities. I think he did finances, but it was a, it was a desk job <coughs> somewhere. He, you could tell when he was just a kid, history was passion and details, and you know, Max and I had three trips with him, and it wasn't until the third trip we started to really get some of that stuff out of him because he was very factual. <laughs> we did a lot of discussions, and not speaking Japanese. Uh, we've been on the road a little bit doing this film uh, early on, and I had done a treatment. And Paper Lanterns was always one of them because when I read about it and understand what the whole Paper Lantern ceremony is, is at its heart it's meant to be the souls moving on. And over time it's taking on greater importance, which is really a symbolism of peace. And you know, I, you know, we were there in the, in the last year, I think it was a year ago, at the seventh anniversary. And it really, the morning was very emotional. But as the day progressed, it became almost a celebration of peace. Which I think was, we tried to, I think Max's imagery just captures that with all the candles and all the young faces and families. I mean, thousands and thousands of families. I just want to make one comment, which is this is the soundtrack, by the way. We have some if you would like them, they're just for free. <laughs> um, but the cover has this series of paper lanterns, which, if you read Japanese, you can look closely, and it's these were created by handicapped kids at a nearby school in Fukuyama Prefecture. And I think the way, especially Max cut the film, um, it really focuses on, in subtle ways, on children. Like the very first scene, you see kids running up with the kite. And the very last scene, you see the kid look up at his mother. And throughout, there's little subtle references to children. And to me, that's just saying there's hope in a new generation. And I think title Paper Lanterns says that perfectly. And I think, uh, in a way, President Obama reinforce that kind of imagery. He talked in his speech, as you've heard, about children, and he ended the speech with this comment about how today the children of Hiroshima can live a peaceful life, unlike the predecessor. The children, it's the future, it's sinking uh, into the future. My wife and I had the opportunity to attend the 60th anniversary of the bombing, and it's a life, it was to be a life-changing experience. And I'm, I'm, this, film has brought back to me my struggle at the time to put to words the emotions that were triggered in me from that experience of being with those in Hiroshima and how they've embraced um, that experience, turned it around, and have attempted to create it, create a, um, a motivation Really, a, it's a, and this is where I struggle with the words because um, it's not just love. It's, and it was said in the film a few times, it's an absolute conviction that this can't happen to anybody else on the planet again. Would you, so would you like to comment on that as a resident of Hiroshima? Mr. Suzuki was too young to experience the bomb. He was born afterwards, but and he moved to he moved to Hiroshima later on in life. But they've lived in Hiroshima now for fifty years. So just standing here is too overwhelming for me. But uh, yes, of course uh, we have more than one million people living there and at a personal level the feeling toward what happened would be very much varied. And, but overall, uh, now, we are most gracious and uh, grateful to uh, President Obama for coming to visit us. May 27th has made all the difference. And uh, we, it's easier for me to say that uh, we have to accept it but uh, many people do accept and look forward to the future. And so, if you have a chance, please also come. You know, we live in this strange internet dominated sort of world. I had no idea about this film, but I. I've devoted my life to cultural exchange activities between Japan and the United States. 
So every once in a while, I go on to Kickstarter. Do you know what Kickstarter is? It's like a cloud raising, fundraising um, device on, on the internet. And I just go and I put in Japan because I'm interested in what people are creating or doing, what artists want to do about Japan. And a lot of it is kind of garbage. It's weird. It's strange. Right? Not things that I would get terribly excited about. But all of a sudden, this paper lantern jumped up on the computer screen at me about this man who was dedicating his life to preserving the memory of Americans, the enemy. And someone in Lowell, which is almost the next town from where I live, was making a film about it. That was just too interesting for words. So I immediately contacted Barry, and then we started working together. And of course, Barry and Max had worked together on the film as, as a partnership. So I, I'm behind the camera, so I don't talk much. <laughs> um, I actually went to Barry, who works at an advertising agency in Boston, and which is incredible in itself that he has done this with a full-time job. You know, this has been a side project. He's gotten it done, which is very admirable. Um, and I've done a lot of other documentary work on veterans that have been kind of slow and solemn. And he's like, Max, you know, would you want to shoot this? And I'm like, I would love to. You know, this is a great story. Like, how could you say no to that? Um, and then we came back with all this footage, and it was like, well, who's going to edit it? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'll, I'll edit it. <laughs> and then, yeah, that was early, early on. And I forget if you've been talking to Peter at that point. And then we brought Chad on board, and he added the music to it, and it really started to take a life well, of its own. Well, Barry contacted me about three quarters of the editing and said, hey, we've got to get some music for this. The visuals are fantastic, but we need some music to really bring it to life. Do you know anybody who might do some music? And I didn't really know Chad very well, but I knew of him. He had recently graduated from Harvard. He'd gone off to Japan. He was a musician. He spent a lot of time after the tsunami in Tohoku going to schools and going to small villages, playing his violin to help encourage people. So I thought, well, I don't know anything about his music, but why not give it a try? So I put them together, and the results are there. <laughs>